All right. Well, let's uh, let's open up with a word of prayer and uh, we'll get started this morning. God, we love you. We thank you for the gift of this day. We ask for your help, Lord, as we endeavor to steward it in a way that will bring honor and glory to you. Uh, we just pray, Lord, that as we open this day in your word, that you would speak to our hearts and our lives uh, and help us, Lord, uh, to be stronger in this life that we live for you. And uh, Lord, we thank you for that in your strong and mighty name. Amen. All right. So we are we are continuing in our our CEU on um, uh, finding direction for the Lord in need of direction. All of us have been there. Um, and as we have said many times, the good news is, is that God wants to do this for us. Uh, God wants to give us direction in life. Um, many of us can be stubborn, and I say us because I put myself in that. We can be stubborn when it comes to uh, asking for directions or trusting God's directions for our lives. As Proverbs 3 reminds us, it is so easy for us to lean on our own understanding, right? For us to just go the way we want to go. Um, but Proverbs also reminds us that if we will just submit to the Lord, if we'll just trust him with all of our heart, like he'll give us the direction. He'll make our path straight. That's pretty easy, right? It's a very, very simple uh, concept, but maybe a little more difficult to live, live out. As we say many times, this stuff is much easier to teach than it is to live. Um, but, but certainly God wants to provide direction in our life. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about the process of God's direction because it is, a, it is a process. The steps of the righteous man are ordered of the Lord. He will make our paths straight. So it's speaking of, of, of not just God, God taking us from point A and just placing us in point B, but it's a journey where we have to walk. We have to one step at a time. We have to figure out what is God's plan? What is his direction? And take one step at a time as we walk into the fulfillment of that. Uh, so it is, it is a process. What does that process look like? The story of Paul uh, in Acts 20 uh, is a, is a great example of that of that process. Um, now compelled by the Spirit. So we, we talked about a few weeks ago that one of the first steps in finding God's direction is keeping our ears open for those Spirit promptings in our lives. God wants to give us direction. God still desires to speak to and to lead His children. But if our ears and our hearts are not open to His guidance, to His promptings, we will not know what that looks like for our life. It says, I'm going to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. Uh, as we step out in, 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 on God's path for our life, there will, there will always be uncertainty that will, that will find us on that, on that path into God's plan for our life. His directions have great clarity. Right. But they come with uncertainty. We talked about Moses. It was clear. God was God was very clear. There was great clarity. Moses, you are going to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land. That is very clear what God wanted Moses to do. Not only what he wanted them to do, but where he wanted them to go. Right? He showed them the, the point A and the point B. And God will do that for us. He will give us that kind of clarity. I want you to go here. I want you to go there. What is uncertain many times is all that is in between. Moses did not expect the 40 years of wandering in the, in the wilderness. If he would have expected that kind of uncertainty, he would have no doubt stayed. Uh, stayed with the sheep and uh, not not taken the course of of leading a grumbling bunch of people out of out of slavery who many times didn't want to be led out of slavery. Um, <clears throat> Paul says, "I know in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prisons are that prison and hardship are facing me." However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. 
My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Uh, so today we're going to pick up on this, this idea. I only know in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Prisons and our prison and hardships are facing me. Um, one of the one of the things that that we will we will many times find when we are living out uh, God's plan for our life is is resistance, uh, resistance. Now you might you might think that that's uh, uh, sort of counterintuitive, right? We would think of if we're living in God's plans, if we are living in God's blessings, then we should have a resistant free life, right? We should have no resistance. But many times the opposite of that is true. When we are most in the will of God is when many times we will face the most resistance in our life. Um, I was listening to some little clips by T.D. Jakes uh, yesterday, who, had, who just has a way of painting pictures with his words. And, and he was just talking about the fact that, you know, if you, if you are not a threat, then if you're not a threat to do something great for God, then you're never going to be a target of the enemy. And so many times it's not it's not a fact of why am I being why why am I facing such opposition why am I facing such resistance in my life the bigger question should be for us is why am I not facing resistance because if I am not facing resistance in my life that probably means that I am not doing something right or that I'm not living my life in complete submission and obedience to the Lord because anytime we step out to do something for God. Anytime we strive uh, to live out God's plan or to follow His direction for our life, we will face some kind of resistance. Why? It's very simple. Because just as God has this incredible plan for all of our lives, Satan also has a plan, and his plan is for us not to fulfill the plans of God. Right? So he will do anything that he can to keep us from fulfilling God's plan. Now, hopefully for all of us, um, I, I hope that our prisons and hardships will not look like Paul's, like his were literal prisons, right? His, his, his resistance was, um, was literal, literal hardships and, 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 um, uh, uh, torture. I mean, he faced this literally. I, I think many times the resistance that that we face is more of a spiritual, uh, a spiritual hardship, spiritual prisons or emotional hardships or prisons that often come uh, from from relational uh, places of relationship. Right. So maybe it's people rising up against us or people doubting us or people speaking negatively into our life or maybe just the circumstances of life seem to be piling up on us. And, and so many times the prisons and hardships we face are, are a spiritual and not a not a literal uh, but they are ever bit as real right and so I, I think one of the great Bible passages on this is Ephesians 6 um, that that talks to us about about this resistance that we face and sort of what to do with it and I just want to read this uh, read Ephesians 6 or beginning with verse 10 uh, to you I, I know you all know this but I just want you to be encouraged by by these words and then I want to give you a few thoughts outside of the armor of God just some thoughts that sort of frame uh, the armor of God in this in this passage because I think we all know and and, and Paul tells us here the way that we fight resistance is to take up the full armor of God, right? And but but I think there are some ideas that frame this for us that are important for us to remember. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes or the devil's resistance. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. So this is Paul saying, and, and I think a good word for us, so our, our struggle, our resistance, isn't coming from the physical prisons and, and, and hardships necessarily. 
but it's a spiritual battle we're facing. Therefore, uh, you got you to gotta fight it spiritually. Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes and the day of resistance in your life, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything uh, to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet <coughs> fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I, as I should. Uh, now, all of us have heard, have heard countless, uh, countless messages, a plethora, it's another big word, right? Of, of messages on the armor of God, uh, right? Too many for, for all of us to count. So I want to focus on a few of these, a few of these uh, statements that sort of frame uh, the armor of God. And I, I didn't, I didn't give, uh, or, or I didn't put in here the, the verse ten, which is I think where it all starts. Be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. But I think for all of us that that's the, that's the place that this starts, right? That, that we remember that it's greater is He that is in us. Greater is He that is in us than he that is in this world. There is, there is not one of us in this room that is strong enough to fight this resistance on our own. Uh, that's, that's why going back to Proverbs, it tells us not to lean on our own understanding. Why? Because your understanding is not good enough. You will never be smart enough. You will never be strong enough. You will never be good enough on your own to overcome the enemy, to fight the resistance of the enemy on your own. It is greater is He that is in you. Your strength comes from Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is where your strength comes, comes from. And so everything we, we talk about today will, will be predicated upon that. But the first, the first thought that, that I, I want to just give you, that, uh, or, or that Paul gives us, I think, in framing this idea of the armor of God, or this analogy of the armor of God in our life, is that we should stand our ground. That we should stand our ground. Uh, many of you have perhaps heard it said in, in different environments, man, it's time to take a stand. We got we to gotta take a stand against this. We got to take a stand against that. And... Um, no doubt when we look through history, history is marked by, by these great figures who, who, these great historical figures who at some point in their life took a stand, uh, right? We, we see people like uh, Martin Luther King Jr. who took a stand at a pivotal time in, in American history. Uh, I read a book last, last year uh, about Dietrich Bonhoeffer who, who um, took a stand in Nazi Germany uh, when, so many, when so many Christians were leaving the country and fleeing the country. Uh, he, he took a stand against Hitler that ultimately uh, cost him his life, but he was willing to take a stand. Churchill in the same, in the same era. Uh, when many in his own country were saying we should make a deal with Hitler, uh, Churchill said, no, we need to take a stand against, against Hitler. And one, of my, one of my favorite historical figures um, is, is Nelson Mandela, right? Who, who uh, this great figure in, in South Africa who uh, stood for racial inequality or for racial equality in that, in that uh, country and was put in prison for 17 years. I mean, you, you're talking about somebody who had every right to grow bitter, 
right? Uh, but, but he did not allow himself to grow bitter. And when he got out of prison, uh, he, still took, uh, he still took a stand for what is right and led with integrity uh, in a way that was truly a model to the world. Uh, all historical figures who took a stand about some issue of injustice in their, in their world. Um, for all of us, we might not be called upon in the, in the annals of history to take that kind of stand that will be marked by the history books. But every day in our life, there is a war that is going on. Uh, there is a resistance that is, that is coming against us, uh, that is trying to take us down and to take us out. Um, and it is so easy, it's so easy to just sort of run from that battle or sort of ignore that battle, uh, maybe even to pretend that it doesn't exist. Uh, but Paul encourages us to take a stand, to take a stand. Um, I, and, and I think, I think if there's any lesson that, that I've learned in, in years of, of ministry and just, just serving the Lord, um, that, that sometimes more than knowledge and more than, than skill, it's your, it's just pure grit that's going to get you through, uh, life's, life's toughest battles. The ability to truly believe when everything else is falling apart and to stand when it feels like the ground underneath your feet is, is falling away, to stand. Notice how many times Paul says that several times in the, in the opening part of this passage to stand and not just to stand, but to stand firm in our faith. We live in a world that every day tries to shake our faith, that tries to shake us up as, as people. And, and God says, stand and stand firm um, in me. Stand your, your ground. The second thought that, that Paul gives us, if we're gonna, if we're gonna fight this resistance and, and use the armor of God to truly uh, fight this kind of spiritual warfare, he's pray in the spirit. Pray in the spirit on, in verse 18. Always and on every occasion. Again, in, in the Word, Paul tells us, pray, uh, pray without ceasing, right? So, so we know that, that prayer is sort of not just something we do with the five-minute block of our day, but it is, it is, it is really a, a continual posture of, of the believer. We should, not just, uh, we should not just pray five minutes in the morning. Our life should be a lifestyle of prayer. Uh, of, of really constant prayer as we're, as we're walking around, as we're in our classes, as every moment sort of should be a prayerful moment uh, for, for believers. Now, depending on your, your theological or doctrinal persuasion will uh, sort of depend on what you view as praying in the Spirit. Right. But but for all of us, for all of us, there should be this this unison or this fellowship with the with the spirit that we have um, that that would allow us to to truly pray in a way that is led by the spirit or or spirit prompted. Just as just as Paul said, now prompted or compelled by the spirit. I'm going to Jerusalem. There should be a prayerful pursuit in each of us that says, I, I want to be in alignment with the Holy Spirit. I want to be able to, I want to be able to hear his voice and to follow his lead. Uh, third, we need to, we need to stay alert. We need to stay alert. Um, this this past Saturday after the eighth grade banquet, um, I was I was driving home on the motorbike, and they had given us these cute little pillows, the eighth graders with like our full bodies on it, and uh, I was sort of protecting my pillow, uh, and I had my pillow in in one hand that I was using for the gas and acceleration on my motorbike, and. Um, if, if I'm honest, as I was making the turn into Jenga, I'd sort of look down at that pillow, and I was really realizing that uh, 
I was holding my pillow and it was, it was sort of an awkward placement of the pillow because it was sort of inhibiting my ability to accelerate and brake properly. And so I was looking down at my, my pillow and why did I place it right there? And as soon as I'm thinking that thought, my tires hit gravel at the front of Jenga from where they had just replaced these pavers in the road and my motorbike just totally wiped out. It's not my finest moment. Of course, the sop palms come running out and I stand up really quick. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Right. Um, uh, but, but the bottom line is, as I was totally distracted in that moment on my on my motorbike and I lost awareness of what was going on on the road, what was happening on the road. Usually, usually I would consider myself someone who is very aware of my surroundings on the road. But in that moment, I was more infatuated with that pillow that looked like me. <laughs> uh, and, 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 but that's easy for that's easy for us to do spiritually as well. Right. We we uh, can can become and not not necessarily in a bad way, but self-absorbed in, in some ways with our schedule, with our to do list, what we have going on throughout the day that we lose an awareness of everything that's going on around us or perhaps um, uh, the way the enemy is trying to to attack us. And Paul says, hey, stay alert. Stay alert. Don't for one minute take your eye off the road. Don't take your eye off the pad. Don't take your eye off of God because the moment you do, the enemy has laid a trap there and you're going down. Right? So stay alert. And lastly, be persistent praying for all believers. And just two things come to mind uh, in, in this. Uh, no, number one, uh, when we pray for fellow believers, it strengthens them. Right? It lifts them up. I was in Africa a few years ago. And a uh, long story that I'll make short, I was in a car with a, with a missionary. His wife was in another car several miles away. While I'm in the car, we get a call on speakerphone from America. And this pastor uh, uh, named Frank Vandergriff, uh, I, I, I heard him say to, to this missionary, uh, JR, is, is, are you and Shirley okay? And, and JR said, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Shirley's a few miles away. Uh, but, but yeah, we're okay. He said, I was just awakened. It's three o'clock in the morning here. I was awakened and prompted to pray for you guys' safety. And, and JR said, thank you for your prayers. Talked a minute and then hung up. So that was, man, great to know people were praying well. It wasn't 30 seconds later. Shirley, JR's wife, called on speakerphone again in a frantic said, JR, I said, you're not going to believe this. I need you to come here. I was just in an accident. Someone rear-ended me from behind. And this mob this mob formed around the cars that that or the car that Shirley was in very dangerous situation and and she said I, I was just so so scared I was in a panic and and she said then it was just like out of nowhere this little little gap opened up and I was able to just rush through and she said I was fearful for my life but I just this little gap opened up I was able to get through um, and and I often think to myself you know who knows Right. Who knows what happened there? But but what I do know is there was a dangerous situation. And in my mind, someone was willing to pray for for someone when God prompted them and God used those prayers to clear a situation uh, for for Shirley Gould. We never know how our prayers are going to make a difference in the lives of someone else. So so it strengthens the saints, but it also reminds us we're not alone on this journey. We're not alone. God is God has put us around people who should have our backs. We should should have theirs. We're doing this together. So never feel like you are alone in the faith. And if we're praying for other people, we will always be reminded we're not alone in this journey. We're not alone in this journey. And if you don't need it today, you might need to be reminded tomorrow. You're not alone in what you're doing. You're not alone in serving Jesus. You're not alone in this mission. So take solace in the fact that God's put others around you. God bless you. Have a great day.